again, while the slides are coming up, I'll just briefly um, introduce myself. I'm, my name is Alex Murphy. I'm also an Alex, but with an I. Um, I work for a company called World Remit, and what we do um, is international money transfer, but specifically remittances. Um, I'll get into that in a little while, but you know, we talked very briefly earlier about um, this concept of fintech for good and fintech specifically for good all around the world. And we're very much a company that, that holds to that promise. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Before joining World Remit about six months ago, I was with the GSMA, which is the Global um, Trade Association for the mobile telecoms industry. So we're, our members were um, all the mobile operators like Vodafone and EE and um, AT&T, as well as handset manufacturers, Samsung, Huawei, etc. Um, and I worked on this concept called mobile money, which you might have heard of, and I'll get into in just a second if my slides come up. Um, at World Remit, we believe that every transfer... Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've heard the relief. <laughs> right. Um, so, if... A very long presentation, it won't be, I promise. Um, and maybe <coughs> one is interesting. So, I was really glad that uh, Jeffrey from the Better Than Cash Alliance just stood up and, and gave a, a little talk about that because that's very much what World Remit is all about. We partner with mobile money operators all around the world to enable mobile to mobile remittances. So, excellent. transfers in an instant. There are a lot of companies out there, you probably have heard of many of the other uh, money transfer companies. What we offer is, um, as I said, remittances. People, are, um, our clients are primarily migrants and expats living in the developed world and sending money back home to the developing world. When you think of remittances, there are small amounts of money sent, um, you know, often monthly, to family and, and loved ones back home, they're, they go to things like paying school fees, putting a child through school, um, saving up to buy a house or to build a house, saving to invest in a business, um, putting someone, uh, helping someone with medical fees. They're for all sorts of things and taken on a very small scale, remittances um, are, they're, they're impactful to the individual family but not much um, you know, not much on a grand scale. However, on when taken as a whole, remittances are a $560 billion uh, business. They are, it's a huge business, and it vast outnumbers. The, the number of remittances vast outweighs all of the global development aid on, by a factor of a few, many times over. So, um, they're also what the uh, World Bank calls the hidden force in global economics because of the, the important impact that they have on developing world economies, especially um, in a lot of economies, uh, remittances make up to 20 or even 40 percent of GDP. So, oh no, why did that happen? Right. But this is what remittances look like. Today. This is what money transfers in the vast majority of places, you've seen them even on the high streets of London, sending money home is a cash-based process. It's a paper-based process. It's long queues, it's waiting in line, it's taking time off work to get there, it's spending money to send money. And because of this model, it's actually very costly for the money transfer operators to run and that cost falls on the customer in almost all cases. In, uh, so when you think of the actual global average of sending money internationally is between seven or eight percent. 
But if that expands even more when it's sending to the developing world, um, the average cost of sending money to sub-Saharan Africa is 12%, and can be as high as, and as often, up to 20%. When you're thinking that these are people who are sending money back home to their friend, friends and family, saving up money um, as much as they can, this adds up. This is a huge cost to ordinary, uh, particularly to Africans in sub-Saharan Africa. The World Bank estimates that it costs Africans, ordinary Africans, around $2 billion a year, which could be going to families and to development. But that's all changing now with a simple thing, the mobile phone. Um, and as I mentioned when I was at the GSMA, I worked on uh, mobile money, which is a very swiftly growing service that's offered actually in a lot of places. Um, I wonder if, how many people are familiar with the very famous mobile money service M-Pesa in Kenya, but run by a company called Safaricom, they're a mobile telecoms operator. Okay, brilliant, yeah, lots of people. Um, how, many, how many mobile money services do you think there actually are around the world? 3,000. <laughs> 25. 25. Five. Five. Six and a half. Six and a half. <laughs> okay, so there are 200, over 260 services just like M-Pesa in Kenya in countries all over the world. All the way from Paraguay to Pakistan. They're in every single, in 90 countries. The vast majority of which are in the developing world because mobile money is a service for unbanked users. So it, it's a service for people who don't have access to formal financial services. Um, what you can do with mobile money is you can send money to another person, you can pay bills, especially things like utility bills, uh, pay for your electricity, <coughs> pay for water, paying for school fees, receiving government ben um, benefits, salary payments. This is fintech as any fintech product could possibly be, and it's started in the developing world. The first mobile money service actually was developed in um, the Philippines. So when it comes to um, but, you know, so it's a great concept. How many people are actually using this service? And this is another great misconception. Um, we know that in 2012, there are about 30 million active users of mobile money around the world. In 2013, that doubled to 60 million. Last year, as of two, uh, December 2014, which is the latest figures that we have, we know that there are over 103 million active users of mobile money all around the world. So to put that in perspective, that's like one in every five people in the European Union actively using their mobile phone to make payments, to um, buy things, to send money to other people. And these are all people who don't necessarily have to have a bank account to be using this service. So when you think of it in the context of the traditional money transfer scheme, that's absurd <coughs> and ridiculous. And the models of cash-based high street agents just doesn't make sense today when what you can actually do is this. And this is what we do at World Remit. Money, uh, mobile to mobile remittances. People sending from an app in the developed world to their friends and family in the developed world. And this is a, um, what's really exciting about this service is that not only has it taken off rapidly, we see people using it um, all uh, very often already. Now, more than half of our transfers made out of all of the developed world countries that we operate in. That's around um, 50 odd countries, by the way. Um, are sent from a mobile phone, and already mobile money represents more than 30% of the transfers coming out of Europe and out of. So it's not just a developed world phenomenon anymore, sorry, developing world phenomenon anymore. People in the developed world, people who come from these countries where mobile money is used all the time, are preferring it to any other traditional method when they're sending money and receiving money. Um, what's also interesting as well is that we're starting to see different behavior in that traditionally when you're sending money via cash-based agent and you're paying much higher fees, you're gonna be saving up a big chunk of money to send home at the end of the month. When you use, when you're communicating with your loved ones, your family and friends, by the way, it's not all on um, 
you know, these basic feature phones anymore as well. Now we all know with the rapid rise of smartphones, most mobile money services are also offered on a smartphone. Um, you are starting to see, you know, as people communicate with WhatsApp and Skype and Viber and all these um, messaging services, the, the ability to send and receive money at the same time become, becomes part of the conversation. And money is sent home for any little thing. It's sent in small amounts. Um, we're seeing a lot more transactions take place in, in smaller amounts, but more quickly. So this is a massive uh, change in the traditional remittances industry. It's a massive, massive change in the way that these different um, operations, uh, sorry, services are working with each other. And it's a different way in, um, in which people who for a long time had been separated by very vast distances and financial inability to really support their families in the way that they wanted to, to be able to do so now. Very quickly, why is it that we work with these services and why do they care? Um, it's because when you have this whole mobile money system working locally for a very long time, um, mobile money services couldn't really operate internationally. They couldn't really link up with any international ability to receive money or to send money. Um, also, as I mentioned, there, you know, people are transacting in very small amounts. These are unbanked people that are often working in the informal economy, um, but they have all of these needs for paying school fees, medical bills, um, utility bills, etc. And so when you have this whole ecosystem of, of companies and businesses, more people want to use it, uh, but it's quite hard to get money into the system other than the traditional way, which is cash in at an agent. This is, again, locally. Um, or salary payments into the mobile phone directly, then you can use it to do something else. And also things like government um, welfare benefits, that's a huge use case for mobile money all around the world. Um, when, you, when it comes to international remittances, however, the typical inter international remittance value of one transfer is about you know, three to four times uh, any of these other ones. So from, from the perspective of the mobile money operators, this is also a very important part of their um, you know, wider scope of how the service operates in their local economy. Um, and so, again, when it comes to what we want to do, when we think of um, financial innovation in financial technology, for us it's not at all about bringing fintech to the developing world, because it's, it's very clear that um, it's not the case. It's about linking these two worlds of financial innovation together in order to serve the ultimate customer, who is the person who wants to use these services to send money and support their families back home. So, any questions? I guess I'm not seeing questions. You can talk to us Yes, uh, we, we make money on on the transfer. So when you go to our website or to our app, you um, and that's the other thing about you know, bringing services online. It's a, a, a big um, theme of fintech in any case. Is the, the fees are transparent. You you know what you're getting straight away. You get you you're notified of the FX rate and the fee. But what we offer is very low minimum fees because you take out all of those middlemen along the way um, and you're able to get, so sending some, uh, to, so let's say you're sending 10 pounds to the Philippines, you pay less than one pound to, to do that. Um, and that's the lowest minimum fee, but you just you still pay um, 2 99 to send 500 pounds, which is far lower than the average you would be able to get. Those are examples. I'm not sure that's exactly what it is. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. So another thing that when you take uh, money transfer online and you have online processes, you're eliminating paper. So in order, in order for anyone to use our service, you have to have a bank account on the sending side. So your bank KYCs you. But then there's an additional KYC process. We work with a company um, called Jumia, actually, that does um, it lets you scan identity documents, and they have a, a massive database 
that looks at uh, to look at all the potential fraudulent ways that people fake identity documents. Then we also have the other KYC elements of um, you know, checking names against uh, terrorist watch list databases, etc. Uh, when you have that kind of robust digital ability to look at transa transactions and monitor fraudulent transactions, you're also able to stop them before they even happen. Like if someone's using a fake credit card or not trying them multiple times, you know that that's something dodgy and you can stop it from happening straight away. Any others? Okay, so we're taking away from that. <laughs>